With the recent anniversary of the Nation of Israel, which was founded by the United Nations in 1948, Zionists around the world, especially those within evangelical Christianity, they've been in a celebratory mood. Members of Temple Philadelphia in Salinas held a march this morning to celebrate Israel on its 70th anniversary. The congregation marched through the downtown area to the courthouse and back to the church, waving flags and signs in support of Israel. One of the ministers said despite the tension surrounding Israel, their demonstration is not politically motivated. A helicopter came above me, I talked to the pilot, a few missiles, and I ended up pretty good. So, uh, it was a lot of fun, by the way. They've all wished Israel a happy birthday. They're excited. They're running around saying prayers about Israel, and some of them are even shedding a tear. But you see, false doctrine ultimately comes from Satan himself. And I believe Zionism is Satan's attempt to make Christians believe that they have to essentially bow down to Christ-rejecting Jews and emphatically support the UN's nation of Israel. But it's a fraud. It's a fake, and it's a lie straight out of the pit of hell. The question is, why would Satan orchestrate this political movement? Why would he deceive people into adopting a Judaizing worldview? I think the answer is simple, folks. The more Christians who worship this supposed holy land in Israel right now, in 2018, the more Christians are going to contribute to the devil's eventual rise to power through the Antichrist. Now, I want you to take a look at what the Bible says here in Mark 13. It says, But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. The abomination of desolation is the prophetic event that's going to happen at the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. It's going to kickstart 75 days of great tribulation, which will precede the rapture and God pouring out his wrath on this world over the second half of the seven years. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us a little bit more about what's going to happen at the abomination of desolation. It says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Antichrist is going to place an image within a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, built for the Antichrist by the Jews. The Bible calls him the man of perdition, because he's going to literally be possessed by Satan, just like Judas was possessed by Satan. And he's going to sit in the temple and claim to be God incarnate. The abomination is going to occur in the same nation that evangelicals and these other Zionist Christians practically worship to the point of idolatry, folks. Now, what people don't understand is that in doing so, they're paving the way for the rise of the Antichrist, and they're advancing forward to the abomination of desolation. And that's going to be the catalyst for the worst period of tribulation that Bible-believing Christians have ever experienced. Because during that time, God's children are going to be persecuted, they're going to be killed, they're going to be dragged out of homes and beaten and bloodied and battered and thrown into prison. Why? Because they're going to refuse to bow down to the image of the beast. They're going to refuse to worship Satan. Now, some Christian Zionists honestly believe that their political ideology is biblical. Somehow, some way, even though it totally contradicts scores of scriptures, this is what they've been deceived into believing. But let's examine what the Bible actually says, and let's see if their position, which is touted by the old IFB and many others, actually holds water. 
And of course, their position is that the Jews are God's special chosen people. Here's what the Bible says in Exodus 19, 5. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. We see here that God says the Israelites will be a peculiar treasure, but they have to obey his voice. It says if they obey his voice and if they keep his covenant, then they're going to be a peculiar treasure. In Hebrews 8, 8, the Bible says there, for finding fault with them, he saith, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And in verse 13 of that same chapter, it says, in that, he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. The old covenant eventually waxed old and decayed. It vanished away because the Israelites couldn't hold their end of the bargain. They failed. So God made a new covenant, this time with Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, let's take a look at what the Bible says about those who've accepted this covenant. In Peter's epistle, and by the way, he's writing to Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, Gentile nations. And he says here in 1 Peter chapter number 2, But ye are a chosen generation. I thought the Jews were the chosen people. Here, Christians are being referred to as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. And holy nation, listen to this, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, who is peculiar? Well, the answer is those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's writing to save people, folks. The truth is, there's always been one gospel. There's always been one way to heaven through Christ. And so today, God's chosen people are those who are saved and those who have been saved since the beginning of time. They're a peculiar people because they're in Christ. The Bible contains a plethora of conditional if-then statements. The Israelites, they were told that they could be a peculiar treasure only if they kept God's covenants. Today, the Jews reject the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not a peculiar treasure. They've rejected God's covenant. They want nothing to do with it. Only those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him alone for salvation are going to be partakers of the promises made to Abraham. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible teaches, yet for some reason it triggers these Zionists, it triggers these old IFB Judaizers. Only those who are saved will one day inherit a special piece of land. And this land is not going to be begotten of the United Nations. It's going to be a heavenly city, New Jerusalem. Galatians chapter number 3 says this in verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. And in verse 29 of this same chapter, the Bible reads, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. It doesn't get any easier than that. A toddler could understand this. The promises were made to Abraham and his seed. The Bible defines that word in Galatians 3.16 when it says that Abraham's seed is one, which is Christ. Everyone who's ever been saved is Abraham's seed. Now, when it comes to being a part of the nation of Israel, under the Old Covenant, the Israelites needed to follow certain ordinances, which, by the way, newsflash to you Hebrew roots heretics, they no longer apply to New Testament Christians, but that's a different video for a different time, in order to earn rewards and blessings and live within that physical nation of Israel, which doesn't exist anymore, and it was designed to be a light to the Gentiles, in order to live there, okay, they had to follow certain regulations. Leviticus 20:22 20, says, Ye shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them, that the land which I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. The Israelites had to get saved by faith to go to heaven. All right, that's a different issue. But Leviticus 20:22 20, gives us the conditions for what they had to do to live in the Old Testament physical nation of Israel. That's changed today. Because the physical nation 
was destroyed by the Roman Empire. It's done. It's finished. The old covenant has waxed old and decayed. Today, that physical nation is now a spiritual one. And every believer is a citizen. God chose a physical nation in the Old Testament for a specific purpose. I'm not denying that. But today, the true Israel is made up of believers. Ephesians chapter 2 says this, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made, a, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God and one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore, listen to this, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. The Bible clearly says there that those who are saved are citizens of a spiritual Israel. Remember, in 1 Peter chapter 2, Christians are referred to as a holy nation. That must be a spiritual nation. You want to gain access to that spiritual nation? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Israelites failed to keep the Old Covenant. They were, as a result, kicked out of their land. Let's just pretend for a second that the nation of Israel today, sitting in the Middle East right now, is legitimate. They're not following God's statutes, so why would he bless them? Why would he keep them there? That doesn't match with God's pattern of behavior throughout the entire Old Testament, and it makes no sense. The bottom line is, those who are Christ's are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Romans chapter 9, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Uh Uh-oh. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not, not the children of Israel. God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. I'm going to stop there. These Judaizers, these Zionists will say, well, you see, all this is saying is the physical descendants of Isaac are the ones who are chosen by God and are blessed and are special, etc. No, that's not what it's saying. It literally says there in verse 8 that the children of the flesh are not the children of God. Notice what the Bible says in verse 6. They are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Jews claiming to be Abraham's seed, who believe they're owed a set of promises and blessings because of their lineage. They're the synagogue of Satan, folks. In Romans chapter 9, the Bible says the children of the promise are counted for the seed. The question is, though, who are the children of the promise? Well, the Bible has the answer. The Bible always has the answer. I'm going to read to you in Galatians chapter 4, starting in verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory. You see that? It's an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath hath many more children than she which hath an husband." Listen to this. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Remember, he's talking to the Galatians. Verse 29, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. According to verse 28, Christians are children of the promise. There's your answer. 
Moreover, it's worth noting, the Bible says that the bondwoman, which is an allegory for Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage, shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Case closed, ladies and gentlemen. This clearly refutes the false claim that saved Christians simply get in on the promises, along with the modern-day Christ-rejecting Jews in Israel. Adherence to this false religion of Judaism blaspheme the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. In fact, the Babylonian Talmud, which is their preferred religious text, says some of the most disgusting, wicked, blasphemous things about Jesus that I'm not even going to talk about in this video. It makes me sick. It makes me want to throw up. The religion of Judaism is an antichrist religion. It's exhibit A of an antichrist religion that rejects the Messiah. And on top of that, of course, rejects the gospel. 1 John 2.22. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. It says this. This is such a powerful verse. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Many of the Jews didn't believe Jesus during his earthly ministry, and they don't believe on him now. Okay? The question is, who will they believe? John 5, 43. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. I believe this is saying that the Jews will receive the Antichrist. 1 John 2, 18, little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now, of course, in John 5, 43, that's Jesus talking, and I believe he's saying they're going to believe on someone else instead of him. And I think that's a reference to the Antichrist, which is, of course, talked about there in 1 John 2, 18. So one day there's going to be a man who rises to the top of the New World Order power structure, who's going to claim to be the Messiah, who's going to claim to be God himself, who's going to unite the world religions, who will run a corporate world government, a tyrannical world government. That's who the Jews will receive. That's who they're helping to bring in today. Here's the good news. God's going to destroy the Antichrist. He will totally dismantle his kingdom. He will subsequently establish his millennial reign on this earth, and then, and only then, will Abraham's seed inherit the true promised land. Not the fraud that's sitting there in the Middle East today, but the true promised land, the holy land, the true holy land. Then, saved Christians will rule and reign with Christ, the true Messiah. Oh, and by the way, at that point, Zionism, the satanic agenda, will be defeated. That's all I've got for this video. Look into what I said. Don't just deny it because of the traditions of men you've been taught, and you'll be surprised what you find out. God bless you all, and I'll talk to you guys again after a while.